your faithfulness I will rest in your promises my confidence is your Have you ever heard of the rule of three? Some of you may have. It's a literary term. And the idea is we often express things in three ways or three phrases. Or three just seems to be a particular number. For example, you're familiar with the story of the three little pigs. Why not four? Why not two? There's just something magical about the number three. Or maybe you've heard of Goldilocks and the how many bears? Three bears. There's just something where three tends to resonate with us better than other numbers. Some people suggest it's because 
three can form a pattern where one or two, there's really no pattern to them. I don't know. But even Thomas Jefferson, when he was writing the Declaration of Independence, talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here again, three ideas put together. Going all the way back to um, Julius Caesar. Some of you may remember his famous phrase, I came, I saw, I conquered. Or my Latin teacher used to say, winnie, witty, wicky. That always sounded weird when he said it that way. But It's that rule of three. We, and you'll often hear people, we pray in rules of three, we'll offer a prayer, and three phrases come out. We have to have three or it's just not right. Now, some of you maybe had not ever noticed that, but you're going to now. Because I've mentioned it, and I've got your reticulator activating system going. Now, aren't you impressed? I went to church, and my reticular activating system got started. Woo! You all have one, and you've all used it. You just didn't know that's what it was. An example is, suppose you buy a car that you've never had before. A brand you never had. Of course, if you buy a car, you didn't have it before. You buy a brand of car you never had before. And how often then do you start seeing that same brand of car on the highway? It's like they're everywhere. Before, you never even noticed them. But now that you have one, you start to notice the same kind of car all over the place. That's your reticular activating system at work. Once something becomes common to you, you begin to see it everywhere. Whoopee, what's that have to do with the sermon? Just thought I'd throw something in for you. Just your, your reticular activating system is going to be looking for rules of three. You're going to be evaluating people's talk, prayers. Why do preachers have three-point sermons? Why is that such a, a rule of thumb for preachers? Well, that's that magical three that we have. In the Psalms, I don't know that David actually knew about reticular activating systems or the rule of three, but even in Psalms, we see this rule of three in place. Anybody know where the activate, speaking of activators, yeah, we had a funeral here this week and things get rearranged. All right, let's see. Even in the Psalms, David has this rule of three. In Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, this phrase is used three times. And some people think Psalm 42 and 43 used to be one psalm. But for liturgical reasons, whatever that is, it was divided into two different psalms. So we're going to kind of treat them as one. But three times in Psalm 42 and 43, this phrase shows up. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? The writer of the psalm is expressing some kind of angst in his life. Something's not going right. And he wonders, why am I feeling depressed? You ever felt that way? Things just don't seem to be going the way you want them to do. And so let's look through Psalm 42 and 43. The psalmist gives us some reasons why he's feeling cast down. And maybe we can relate to some of them. And we can think of other reasons we may occasionally feel downcast or depressed or just low. Whatever term you prefer. He begins in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. 
And then that question, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? One of the reasons the psalmist has for feeling downcast is because he just feels like God seems far away from him. Now, he talks about a time when he had a close relationship with God. Now, some, some scholars believe this psalm was written when Israel was in exile and they'd been taken away from the land of Israel. And this fellow had been prevented from going to the temple and worshiping God. Now, you have to remember, in Israel in those days, there were only three times the Jews were actually required to go to the temple to worship. The, day of Pentecost, uh, the Passover, Pentecost, both in the spring, and then the, the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. And as you look through the Old Testament, God said, I, I expect every male to attend worship at the temple or wherever I had set my place to worship. I expect you to be there those three days. And you can imagine people sort of argue with God, well, if everybody leaves their home, aren't they going to be attacked by robbers? And God promised them, if you do this, if you come to my place and worship me these three occasions, I'll make sure no one steals anything you have, no one, no one takes your crops, no one's going to affect you. you got to trust me. Now, in those days, they didn't have a synagogue on every corner or a church on every corner in town. They had the temple. And three times a year, they were expected to go to the temple to worship God, to offer sacrifices, and do their religious obligations. When you're in exile, you can't even go to the temple three times a year. And this fellow has been in exile, and he's just feeling this distance from God. He can't go to the house of God and offer his sacrifices. He can't go to the house of God and worship and praise God. He's stuck in some foreign land, and he feels like God is far from him. Now, we don't have those restrictions these days. You know, I think there are some people who might wish God would tell Christians, just go to church three times a year. It's all that's required. We, we might like that, really. But sometimes... We just, for whatever reason, we tend to, to miss church. We tend to miss gathering together with other Christians. We just miss that opportunity to be together to worship. Now, I know in, in, in nowadays, if you can't make it to church, you can watch online. And, and that's probably a good second, second thing to do. Of course, in Israel those days, they, they didn't have live streaming, did they? I mean, live streaming was, you were there. That's as live as it got. We have opportunities now, and, and I think it's a good thing. People can turn on their television and watch TV. They can turn on their Facebook page and watch a service and say, well, I'd really like to be there, but I just can't make it. We have those opportunities. But it's still not the same, is it? I mean, you can hear the songs. You can hear the sermon. But there's still something to be said for being with God's people. I know the last few months of Ramona's life, when she was unable to get out and be with us, she goes, I can watch you on Facebook, but it's just not the same. I don't get to see the people. And that's what she missed. And sometimes we can watch a church service, but still feel that God is a bit distant from us because we're just not there with his people. We don't get the, the, the feeling of being in a special place. You know, sitting at our breakfast table is just not quite the same as being in a hard pew, is it? Being in our PJs on the couch just isn't the same as sitting here on these wonderfully comfortable pews that we have. But spiritually, it's not the same either. And sometimes we just miss being together with God's people. The psalmist even writes, there were times in the past when, when I led people to the temple. As you look in the history of Israel and the history of the psalms, there were certain psalms toward the end of the book that when people were gathering to Jerusalem to approach the temple. There were certain psalms that they would sing. 
as a crowd marching through the streets. And you can imagine how that might sound. And this fellow writes, I used to lead those throngs of people to the temple. I used to be a part of that worship service. I used to be involved. But now I just can't be because I'm taken away from it all. I can't be there. You know, sometimes that happens, doesn't it? People get really involved in a church service. We don't lead people through the streets singing songs, but sometimes we get here and lead Sunday school classes. We lead song services. We offer prayers in the service. We do all these things, and then for whatever reason, we just aren't able to do that anymore. We just get that feeling like it's just not the same. And like, like the writer of the psalm, maybe we get a little bit downcast. And that's the reason. We're just not able to be with God's people like we would love to be with God's people. We're not able to worship with other people like we would like to worship with other people. And the psalmist is feeling that. He says, I'm downcast because I want to be where God is. I want to be where he wants me to be. But circumstances just prevent that. I suspect many of us here have felt that way on occasion. Maybe we get sick and just not able to be at church. Oh man, something just isn't right today. I hope that's how we sometimes feel when we're not able to be with God's people. It's just circumstances prevent us that if it happens too long, oh, I just feel like God is becoming more and more distant and my soul is thirsting and I'm parched and I draw, I'm dry and I just want to be with God's people in God's house. What a great attitude to have. And the psalmist was prevented from having that. And he said, that's one reason I'm downcast. I'm just not able to be with God's people. There's another reason the psalmist felt downcast. You know, life can be overwhelming. And it sometimes can. Notice what he writes, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And then again, he asks that question, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Let's face it, sometimes life can just be overwhelming. He uses a way to describe that as deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. Have you ever been out somewhere in nature where there's a really huge waterfall? Now, not, we're not talking Niagara Falls type waterfall. That would kill you. But there's a waterfall coming down, and it's just a little bit noisy. And, you know, if you stand there at the base of the waterfall, it feels good for a while, but then it just starts to get to you. You go, oh, that's a bit much here, a little bit too much for me, so we have to move. Or maybe you've been swimming in the ocean. Last week, we showed a video of some missionaries we support in New Zealand, and they had a baptism at the ocean. That can be a tricky thing. I've had a baptism in the ocean. At the end of April, thank you very much. That was freezing. <laughs> but when you walk out into the ocean, some of you have been there. You know what I'm talking about. You walk out into the ocean, there's maybe this much water. And then before you know it, there's waves crashing over your head. And if you're not prepared for it, it can knock you for a loop and do all kinds of damage to you. I remember the first time our family visited some friends near Philadelphia. We lived in western Pennsylvania, far from the ocean. Never been there, never seen it, never tasted it, never touched it. But these friends in Philadelphia were going to take us to the ocean in New Jersey. And the whole way there, they're warning us. Now, you got to remember, when you get to the ocean, the waves come in, and when they go out, there's an undercurrent that takes all the sand away from under your feet. So be careful that, that it doesn't knock you down. And while you're watching carefully that the sand doesn't come out from underneath your feet, 
Here comes another wave that's going to knock you over if you're not careful. And so you're watching out here for waves. You're watching down here, watching the sand. You run out of things to watch for. By the time we got to the beach, I didn't want to go in. I was in maybe sixth or seventh grade. I was too old to be afraid, but I'm not sure I wanted to go in the ocean with all that undercurrent and overcurrent and a wave coming in. We were there in the water, and, and some big wave came in. It hit some lady standing there and rearranged her bathing suit. Our parents got us away from there rather quickly. <laughs> I thought, man alive, this is wild and crazy stuff. Standing there in an ocean can knock you back and forth. Then, of course, we moved to Long Island and went to the ocean quite a bit, learned how to maneuver it a little bit. But the writer is talking about life sometimes feels like you're in the edge of the ocean. It's just knocking you back and forth. The, the undercurrent's taking everything out from under you, and the overcurrent's taking everything above you, and it's just knocking you all over the place. I've got some scars a few places when the waves knocked me on the beach at Jones Beach there in New York. Sometimes life feels that way. We just can't get a break. Just when you think that oh, the, the waves have calmed down and you think you can start to do something, boom, here comes another one. Ever felt life was like that? Just can't get a break. Somehow the rule of three doesn't apply to life, does it? We often talk like, well, things come in threes. But in reality, they come in fours and fives and sixes and eights and tens. It's just a constant onslaught of one thing after another. We're just not sure we can handle this anymore. And the writer of Psalm says, sometimes that's how I feel. It's like the ocean is calling to itself, hey, get ready. We're going to swamp this guy one more time. And in it comes. One time when I was visiting my dad in New Jersey, when they lived in New Jersey, we decided to go fishing. He had a boat, not a big one. We we're going to go out fishing. Now, there had been a hurricane coming up the coast. But we thought, ah, it'll be okay. So we took his little boat out, got into the ocean, and the waves just began rocking that thing. We thought, what do we do? Turn around and go in. We looked all the way down in one of those big fishing boats, you know, the, those charter boats that people pay a whole lot of money to go out and fish. It had crashed on the shore. We saw it. Go, Whoa, what are we doing out here? There are times the ocean can just rock you like you have no clue if you're going to survive or not. Obviously, we did, or I wouldn't be here. But you just feel overwhelmed by life. And we all have those things that we face. It's not the same for everybody. About this time of year, for some students, it's final exams coming up. Oh, man, that's just going to rock our world. We don't prepare for final exams for 15 weeks, and suddenly, here it comes. We have to study. We used to joke at the college where, you know, the last two weeks of school, freshmen discover the library. Hadn't been there all year. All of a sudden, there's a library? Time to get down to business. Life just throws us things one after another, loss of job, loss of life of a friend, uh, inflation, deflation, you, whatever it is, government, non-government, everything throws stuff at us. And we can begin to get overwhelmed. And, and it bothers us and we get a little bit depressed and discouraged because life just doesn't seem to be fair. I mean, we tell our kids that all the time. Life isn't fair when they complain. But when we complain, somebody needs to remind us life isn't fair. But it affects us. And sometimes it affects our relationship with God. Because we might have a tendency to think God is doing this to me. And if God is doing this to me, who needs him? Especially when we look at our non-Christian friends and neighbors and nothing seems to be bothering them. And we wonder, what's the worth of following God if he's allowing all these things to happen to me? And we get discouraged. I mean, it happens. And the psalmist was feeling that life is overwhelming. God is far away. Why am I downcast? I think I have an idea. Life isn't fair and God doesn't seem to care. And that can really be a bad 
combination of things to try to deal with. But the psalmist goes on in, in uh, Psalm 43, Vindicate me, O God, defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. Again, he's calling out to God. All these things are happening to me, and my enemies are kind of taunting me, saying, you, you claim to be a God follower, and he's allowing all of this stuff to happen to you? Where's your God? And the psalmist cries out, Now vindicate me, God, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? You, you sense a theme here? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my heart, uh, my God. Sometimes in the midst of the turmoil and depression and, and hard times that we face, we sort of realize maybe I need to recommit my life to God. Maybe I've not been quite as serious with God as I should be. And so we decide it's time to get serious with God. It's time to begin following God once again. He talked about earlier in Psalm 42, I used to do all these things. I used to lead people to the worship. I used to be involved in the worship. I've just not been there for a while. I'm feeling overwhelmed with life. Now I need to get back to God. Maybe that's the thing that needs to get my life back on track. And so he says, Vindicate me, God. Let people know that my following you is not in vain. Let people know that I've made the right choice in being your servant. And then he gets to what he needs to know in verse 3. Send out your light and your truth and let them lead me. We can get distracted from God's word by things that go on around us. We can get distracted from God's word by the circumstances we find ourselves in and the places where we find ourselves that seem to be so far from God, we wonder, where is God in this process? We sometimes think God may have abandoned us. You know, it kind of reminds me of, now this is an old story. I heard this from when I was a kid. I think I heard my dad tell this story. So that's how old this is. But a husband and wife were driving down the road and it's old enough, there was a bench seat in the front. Remember those? Not bucket seats, a bench seat went all the way from door to door. Some of you remember those. So the husband and wife were driving down the street, and he was sitting behind the driver's wheel, and she was sitting over by the window. And she's starting to reflect. She says to her husband, do you remember when we used to drive down the street and we were just sitting right next to each other. He said, yeah, I remember. Yeah, really, real, really into this. She goes, sometimes you'd put your arm around me as we drove, and I'd put my head on your shoulder, and we just feel so close as we're driving down the road. And he said, yeah, starting to mellow a bit. Yeah, I remember those days. They talk a little bit more about those days. And then she says, why don't we do that anymore? He looks at her and says, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> and sometimes that's the way it seems when we're trying to find that relationship with God. God, where are you? You seem so far away. Life just seems to happen. You know, two or three kids along the way can kind of make you move apart when, back in the day when you put the kids on the bent seat between you. Can't do that anymore, can you? Get arrested. But back in the day, you get the kids, even two kids between you on the front seat because there were no seat belts back then. Just got to stop. <laughs> There's your seat belt. Mom's arm or dad's arm, that was it. Now it's a little bit different. But sometimes we just get so overwhelmed, we think, God, where have you gone? 
why are you so far from me? And I think God sometimes would look down and say, you know, I haven't moved. I'm the same place I've always been. Who's moved in this relationship? And the answer always is, we have moved. And sometimes when we try to move back, as the psalmist talks about, it's difficult. It just doesn't seem to work all the time. Maybe we want things to happen too fast. We want a, a former feeling that we had to come all of a sudden. We want some relationship we had to be there right this moment. It doesn't work that way. And we begin to wonder, is my recommitment to God certain? Is it going to work? And we realize what we need to do is pray to God to send his light and his truth and let them lead us. And what they will do is lead us back into a relationship with him, the one we had before. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. God is where God is going to be. And we need to move to where God is. And sometimes that may mean we have to remove some of the barriers in our life that we have put up between us and God, some of the attitudes that we've developed that are not godly attitudes, some of the actions that we've developed that are not godly actions. And these things can interfere with our getting close to God. And maybe we just need to learn to, re to rely on His light and His truth, get back into reading His Word, get back into letting His Word guide us and and show us the path that we need to walk. Show us how we need to live in this world in a way that honors him. And that leads us back to him. It's his word that's going to do that. Sometimes we just simply need to open his book. And say, God, what do you want me to learn from this? And spend more time in his word and more time with him. And he will bring us back. Says, then I will go to the altar of God. To God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Three times in these psalms, the psalmist asks the question, Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? We've all been there, I'm sure. But notice his antidote. Every time he asks the question, he makes this response, Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. When you're feeling downcast, when you're feeling like God is distant, when you feel like life is overwhelming and just it's one wave of circumstance after another and you've quite frankly had enough of them, God, are you going to make them stop? And when your re return to God just doesn't seem to be catching the way you hoped it would, the psalmist reminds us, hope in God. Hope in this sense is a confident expectation that God will do what he promised to do. It's to renew that trust in God, to renew that confidence in God. That he knows what he's doing, and he will respond to our prayer. But in the process, he may require some change of us. There may be some things we need to change as we draw clearer, draw nearer to God. But our hope is in God. We're not going to help each other get close to God. Only God can do that. Our hope is in God. Our confidence is in God. And we shall praise him again for, for God is our salvation. And he is our God. When life seems rough, when God seems far, when life doesn't seem fair, when you wonder if God is even treating you fairly, Psalmist says, just keep your hope and your trust in God. Let his light and his word and his truth lead you day by day because he will not lead you astray. He will lead you directly back to him. And as you get closer to God, then you'll have the desire once again to be with his people and to be in the place where God has desired us to be, to meet with him to honor him, to worship him, and to praise him, and then take that with us into life day by day, to honor him and to praise him. Ever felt discouraged? <laughs> hey, if you're human, you have. Even Christians feel discouraged. We ought not to think like 
we've done some terrible thing that we're feeling a little bit out of touch with God. It happens. It happens to the best of them, let alone to the rest of us. But that reminder from the psalmist, hope in God, he'll lead you home and he'll provide you the salvation that you need to have. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we know how the psalmist must have felt. There are times in our lives when you must seem far from us. There are times in our lives when life just seems so overwhelming, we don't know how we're going to survive. But we're thankful, Lord, that you've given us the promise. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And maybe learn to trust in that promise that you have given us. And maybe learn to reach out to others who can strengthen us and encourage us along the way. May we never abandon you. But may our difficulties in life draw us even closer to you and closer to your people. That together we realize we have hope in you. And you give us the salvation that we need through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As we come to our time of communion this morning, I want to go all the way back to the beginning um, of creation. And as you go through the creation story, you see all the things that God has made. And we see from the skies to the animals to the waters to the people, you and I, that God created. It says that he created in our image. And then you get straight into the story 
of Adam and Eve. And what I find fascinating about that story is God actually puts two trees in the middle of the garden, but he only says you cannot eat from one. And that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then what happens is Adam and Eve both eat of that tree. And now God says they have become like us in that they know the difference between good and evil. But so often as we read the scriptures, we miss the part that the tree of life is sitting right there in that garden as well. And it's easy for us to sometimes come to a conclusion that temptation is so far removed from us. But what I see here is both trees are right here next to each other. There's the tree that offers life, and then the tree that offers death. You can't eat from one, but he doesn't say you can't eat from the other. And so I often get asked quite often, why, why is it in the Old Testament people live to be five, six, seven hundred years old, and then you get Methuselah, who's 996 years old before he departs this world, and then we get to our day and age, and people are lucky to live to a hundred. And my my educated guess on that is because we've become that removed from the tree of life. And as the Old Testament goes